Insects are some of the natural world's greatest marvels of design. Their fast, agile movements allow them to navigate through dynamic and unpredictable environments. That's why roboticists have long tried to mimic shapes and motions found in the insect world. From bees to flies to cockroaches and even fleas, over the last few years, these bug machines have evolved beyond a clunky proof of concept. Armed with sensors and tiny cameras, this new wave of insectile robots could in theory pollinate crops or help with complex search and rescue missions. But let's be real, flies are already annoying enough and that's without the ability to monitor our every move. Robot insects have a lot of exciting potential applications, but in the age of digital big brother, you always gotta ask, will this tech eventually spy on me or kill me? So tiny. A little robofly right here. You can see that um, it's actually got two little um, two little wings, just like an actual insect. And at the top up here, there's a tiny solar cell. Vikram Iyer is an electrical engineer at the University of Washington and a central part of the team who created Robofly. The tiny robot is part of a new generation of mechanical insects, fluttering and crawling out of labs around the world. Like Harvard's famous RoboBee, a flapping robot with a three centimeter wingspan that can hover and perform controlled flight movements. One of the big challenges there is that these, um, you know, these robots are so small that they can't carry a battery. Even the smallest like coin cell or watch battery um, is, you know, many times heavier than, than the whole robot itself. And, and, and these batteries can't store very much energy. And so what we did in this work was develop a method to wirelessly transfer power to them, actually using a laser. Robofly was a revolutionary step in the world of insectile robotics because it finally cut the cord with its power source, making it the first functional wireless robotic insect. The autonomous robot is powered by a laser beam that activates a miniature onboard circuit which then sends energy to flutter its tiny wings. We actually have a setup over here uh, that um, that has a, a set of motion capture cameras that allows us to track very precisely exactly where the robot is moving um, and to also be able to send controls, uh, control commands back to that to move it around. Um, so this is really helpful for like developing control algorithms to actually get it to hover stably. Um, in terms of, uh, we're, we're also working on a wireless link uh, to be able to wirelessly send commands to it. Weighing slightly more than a toothpick, Robofly's minuscule size is massively advantageous. It can access a whole world of tight spaces that its propeller-driven counterparts couldn't. These robots are also fairly cheap to mass produce, which means entire swarms could be deployed to different areas. You could think for something like a search and rescue application where people can't go into this uh, some scenario where it's, you know, it's dangerous or again, it's in a very closed, confined space. If you could send in some kind of robot to go in and, and do these tasks, survey an area, that would be really useful. Say you want to sense like gas leaks along a pipeline or measure the health of individual plants on a farm. You want something that is small enough that you could have a large group of these flying around and, uh, and you know, sense these things. Have you had the Robofly um, interact with an actual insect before? I don't know that we've had it interact in any in, in any way with an insect, but we we definitely have some pictures where there there are insects in the lab that are you know next to the robot. I wonder what they're thinking. <laughs> just just like who's this new kid on the block? That is and actually you know it's it's interesting that you bring up like what an insect is thinking because part of the the technologies that have come out of um, uh, developing all the electronics for this is um, we, we can also build these uh, miniaturized sensors that we can put on live insects. Vikram's latest work takes the Robofly technology to the next level. He helped develop tiny little camera equipped backpacks that could actually be mounted on living creatures. These micro backpacks were attached to bees and other flying insects. The idea was to track and destroy invasive Asian giant hornets, aka murder hornets, in Washington state last year. Because the intersection of bugs and robots goes far beyond simple mimicry, 
Engineers have attached tiny computer systems to cockroaches, allowing the insects to be remote controlled by sending electrical signals to their brains. All kinds of Frankenstein-like possibilities are being explored. I have a collaborator here at UW who's shown that you can actually use the, the antenna from, uh, from a moth to detect different kinds of scents. Um, and I, I think going forward, if we can start thinking about ways to, uh, uh, to, to build on this work, say to genetically modify um, the, you know, this part of the animal itself to create this customized sensor that, uh, you know, that can measure anything from say, say explosives to even, even COVID. Which might not be great for the moss, but could work out for us. These creations may very well one day sniff out diseases and find pipeline leaks. But there's something about swarms of roboflies, undead cockroaches, or moth cyborgs that just sets off my internal hellish dystopian future alarm. Maybe that's just contemplating a terrifying future, where say bees have become so scarce that we depend on robots to pollinate crops. Or perhaps it's because we live in a world where technology is already tracking half of what we do. And Big Brother has a long history of crossing data gathering tech with animals for dubious or clandestine reasons. You know. Dolphins equipped with cameras have been used by the military. Pigeons were used as early as World War I to get um, uh, surveillance um, by attaching like literally cameras to them. And so there's a long history of sort of biomimicry, which is what it's called, you know, robots or machines that mimic the affordances of insects and birds and animals, um, but also literal animals turned into kind of cyborgs in service of surveillance. Ryan Callow is a law professor at the University of Washington specializing in emerging technology with a focus on robotics and AI. In 2013, he testified before the U.S. Senate about law enforcement's use of drones. One of the main ways that robots implicate privacy is by significantly um, extending our, our surveillance capability. And some of the earliest applications of artificial intelligence um, and robotics have been in service of being able to engage in, in surveillance more easily. And if you couple that with how small um, these robots can get and therefore indetectable, um, yeah, of course, there are, there are, that raises concerns. In fact, the history of robotic insects is directly tied to intelligence gathering. As far back as the 1970s, the CIA was developing a miniature unmanned aerial vehicle called the Insectothopter. Okay, terrible name, I know. But the dragonfly-shaped robot did show promise, with a 200-meter range and 60-second flight time. Well, under ideal weather conditions, that is. Apparently, the 1-gram spycraft was never actually used in a mission. It had to be abandoned after they realized it couldn't even withstand a gentle breeze. But it inspired other more sophisticated and capable robo-insects. I mean, so the, the CIA use of that, that you know, tiny little um, dragonfly the context for that was, of course, the Cold War, right? And the concern was the communist threat. And so in that context, you know, spying equipment, you know, robotics and, and other kinds of um, uh, techniques were uh, developed and in, 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 in shrouded in secrecy so that so we could have a technical edge. But the truth of the matter is, is that the big problems in artificial intelligence and robotics today require enormous cooperation. And the people that are doing this work in a really robust, serious way are sharing their work in the form of published articles. And the, be and the best teams that we have um, often com are comprised of people that come from many different nations. Transparency might help the technology stay under the public eye. But it doesn't altogether prevent these tiny eyes in the sky from being hijacked for nefarious purposes. That could be some intelligence dragnet. It could be Mark Zuckerberg dive-bombing your house with robo-moths to better sniff out your advertising preferences. Ryan says he fears the theoretical hazards could even go beyond surveillance. Certainly a, an insectile robot that's capable of getting close enough to people to film them and, and to record them could also deliver um, uh, some kind of fatal you know, poison, for example, or some kind of, you know, um, some, some, they, they could also kill. Think about it. Have you ever met a fly that couldn't get past security? Uh, this guy's bothering me here. President Trump and I stand with you. And I have that wall. Yeah, so a few folks have definitely brought up the Black Mirror episode where you have, um, you know, the, the killer robot insect things. Ah, uh, 
yes, the Black Mirror episode. And I think the good news is we are, we're not at that point, right? It's really important for researchers like myself and others to start strongly considering security and privacy as we build these things, especially once we start talking about the wireless link. And so that's why I think an important part of this research going forward is to, um, to expose both the limitations of these platforms as well as developing strategies to secure them, right? Um, making sure that, say, if, uh, if someone is trying to use something like this to spy on you, can you figure that out? The experts we interviewed agreed that we're at a critical juncture with this type of technology. And having these conversations about ethics and privacy now could very well direct how robotic insects are ultimately used. There are certain technologies that really lend themselves to mischief. You know, weapons, you know, and so that I don't want to put these insects in those categories, right? I would be hard pressed to blame the research teams that are working on miniaturization. Um, that said, it is incumbent upon us as a society to keep a close eye on these developments um, so we feel comfortable with the, the uses to which these powerful but small <laughs> robots are being put.